right, and it's my um, pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, who is Shane Doyle. Shane is a colleague and a friend. We've worked together for many years. Uh, Shane is an enrolled member of the Crow Tribe. He grew up in Crow Agency, Montana. He has a bachelor's degree in elementary education, a master's degree in Native American studies, and a PhD in education curriculum and instruction from Montana State University right here in Bozeman. Shane started his career teaching fourth and fifth grade in Lodgegrass, Montana, and he's been teaching in various capacities ever since. Since 2006, he has worked professionally with many public schools throughout Montana on Indian Education for All curriculum and also as a cultural consultant. Shane has worked professionally with each of the tribal colleges over the past decade on numerous state and federal grants. For the past five or six years, Shane has worked with local school districts throughout Montana to take teachers on field trips to all of Montana's reservations, also to the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming and the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. I've talked with many of the teachers who went on these field trips. Actually, there's, I think, a couple of them in the audience tonight. And it was a life-changing event for all of them. So I think that is one of Shane's greatest contributions to Montana education. Shane is currently an adjunct professor in the Native American Studies Department here at Montana State University, and as Marcia mentioned, a board member of the Extreme History Project. And as you'll learn here tonight, <coughs> Shane is um, a family man. He, a family is the core of what he's about. He's married to a wonderful woman, Megan, and they have five beautiful children, three girls and two twin little boys. Um, I've had the fortune, like I said, of working with Shane on various projects for the past 10 years. It's been that long, Shane. <laughs> um, he's an inspirational educator, a bridge between the native and the non-native worlds that he lives in. He has a unique ability to bring people together, breaking down stereotypes, and always teaching and speaking with an open heart. So please join me in welcoming Shane Doyle.
so those, those words kind of came ringing back to me just now watching that video that really thousands of years have gone by uh, uh, since people have been here and they are continuing, continuing to be here. So this is a story that has many different angles to it. And uh, it's funny, I've done a lot of interviews over the past few weeks. I've done, uh, you know, NPR, I've done local, you know, talk radio. Um, I was on Al Jazeera. Holy cow. <laughs> you know, I mean, CNN didn't call me, but Al Jazeera called me. So, uh, heck yeah, I answered that phone call. I uh, was sitting up there in the KUSM uh, public television studio with these great big lights on me, uh, speaking on Al Jazeera. And their, their question was, well, Dr. Doyle, you know, uh, which was kind of cool, right, Dr. Doyle. Uh, is it true that this disproves that uh, Europeans did not come to America first? And I said, well, you know, that's what the team believes. That's what, that's what our team believes, that that's, that's what this proves. Well, isn't it true, though, that Dr. Stephen Oppenheimer from the University of da -da 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 disputes that? And it says that, uh, you know, the DNA evidence shows that there's actually European DNA within American Indians today, contemporary American Indians. And so that actually just kind of proves Oppenheimer's theory that Europeans came here. And so this is the first time I'd actually been confronted. Leave it to Al Jazeera, you know. There's no meatballs here, you know. And so I said, well, you know, uh, uh, that's an interesting point, but, uh, you know, Dr. S.K. Willerslev's theory and his uh, DNA analysis, which includes uh, a 24,000 year old boy from Siberia, indicate very strongly uh, that there was a, a central population in Central Asia that migrated to the north and then both east and west. And you have two different populations moving in two different groups. That's the reason why Europeans and contemporary American Indians have uh, the similar DNA within them. And uh, so then he jumped to the next one. Well, isn't it true, though, Dr. Doyle, that uh, these tools they find in France, you know, are just like the Clovis tools? You know? <coughs> this, is, this is where this technology came from, you know? And so they were really trying to, you know, dispute the scientific uh, claims that this study has found. And so that's one angle, right, that you could take on this whole thing. You could just look at the, the claims and, and you could try and dispute them, although I think they're very strong. You know, to that claim I said, well, look, you know, there are no Clovis points anywhere else in the world. You know, these are recyclable spear points. You know, this technology doesn't exist anywhere else. You know, it's found all throughout the continental United States. And uh, we just don't see anything like it. I mean, maybe it's similar, but we're not talking about recyclable spear points. And so he kind of let me off the hook there. So every interview I've done has asked different questions. What about the boy, Shane? What about the burial? You know? And isn't it controversial? Someone did ask that. Isn't it controversial to do DNA study on, you know, old remains? You know, and how do you feel about that? Um, one thing that, that never really came up was the artifacts. You know, I did a ton of interviews and no one really ever asked about the artifacts. Finally, uh, the Canadian broadcast system company asked me, you know, after doing all these interviews for a full week, Shane, are the artifacts being reburied with the boy? Uh, no. <clears throat> well, how do you feel about that? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I was assuming someone would eventually ask me that. Yeah. I said, well, I think that they, we, they should probably be studied and they should be, you know, used to learn and respected. And I think ultimately, uh, in the end, eventually, they need to go back to the same place where the little boy was. And I just kind of left it at that. There's a whole other angle on the story you could take there. Uh, I mean, just pick your angle that you want to take, right? What about the intertribal uh, uh, angle? You know, the fact that 80% of us on um, both continents are related. That's absolutely mind-boggling. We're talking about tens of millions of people with common ancestry. You know? I mean, this is probably the greatest story about family that's ever been told. It hasn't been told yet. 
but it's about to be told. And it's going to be retold and retold by your grandchildren and their grandchildren. And it's going to become their own. And that's how we take history and that's how we make it our own. You know, we represent it. And we represent what we know about American Indian people and who they really are. And so, without going off on too far of a tangent, because my students in here know that's what I'm very capable of doing. <laughs> uh, I want to back up just a little bit and show you some pictures. Because I love pictures. Coming up with the poster for this uh, discussion tonight, and you know, I had to do the little the write up there about what I was going to talk about. You know, I'll try and stick to that. And you know, Marcia said, What should we put in there, Shane? I said, Well, you should put in Fort Parker, you know, which is about 22 miles or so from the place where the Anzac burial was at. This is where my great great grandparents were married, part of the original Crow Reservation. My great 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 grandfather, Mountain Tail, uh, his name is on the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty that made this land part of the Crow Indian Reservation, the original Indian Reservation. I thought that should be on there. And these sacred sites to the, just to the north of it, this uh, high scraper mountain and of course the crazy mountains a little bit further north. Well, we need to have, since we're talking 21st century, we need to have some DNA in there. <laughs> so, you know, put one of those DNA things in there. Those double helixes, I think they're called. Or triple axles or something like that. <laughs> I don't know, I'm getting confused with the Olympics. <laughs> so, then we needed a face. There has to be a face, right? And if one face is going to represent all the Indians, just like I... I have been overexposed and commercialized by the Extreme History Project. Just <laughs> <laughs> Talk about overexposed and commercialized. This fella here, this uh, medicine crow, you know, you, you Google him and you'll find that image all over. It's striking, isn't it? And it says so much. And uh, one of the things that I asked Marcia to do, but she was a little hesitant, was to do the Andy Warhol on that. <laughs> because someone's done an Andy Warhol on that image. You know, colorful, with like all, you know, 21st, 23rd century art dramatics going on. Because as Indian people, we've always taken ourselves way beyond where our bodies could, could take us. You know, and we've always tried to see far beyond where our eyes could see. You know, and, and we're still doing that today, you know. And so this was a man of vision, and he was a man of beauty. And, you know, all those things that all of us admire and wish for our children and wish for ourselves. You didn't speak his language, but you understood by looking at that photo the great respect that that man had for himself and the culture from which he came that embodied that. You know, the, the everyday uh, ceremonial way of life, you know, that these people had uh, created here over so many generations. And so these were some of the images that I wanted in there. Next, the title. Oh man, it couldn't be short. <laughs> I want to share with you where that title came from. Uh, S.G. Willerslev. The uh, Copenhagen geneticist, this is Eski over here, and this is John Murray over in Browning when we went over there, I took Eski over there. Uh, I took Eski to Crow Agency as well uh, when he came here, and uh, he wanted to visit around and talk to some tribal people. And we went to, and we talked to my uncle, and uh, you know, we kind of woke him up. I think it was about, you know, probably 8 o'clock at night. He probably goes to bed about 7.30 or so, you know. Gets up about 4 o'clock and, you know, he's got a full day. Kind of like Larry, you know, and gets up about 4.30 or so. And so he's sitting there basically in his underwear, you know, in his living room. And film crew in there, you know. This is the res, man, you know. <laughs> is all right if we film you? Yeah, go ahead. I don't care. Yeah. Filming my uncle there in his house, this really old house. Telling my uncle the story about this little boy, this burial. 
what was in that burial. And my uncle was just sitting there listening. He didn't really say much. Eski told him, you know, there was an elk antler in there, about 250 to oh, maybe 500 years older than that boy. Oh, shoot, my uncle said, is that right? Huh. He kind of sat there, he listened, we told him the whole story, and he said, yeah, I guess you should go talk to Larson, you know, <laughs> if you're if mommy, while you're here. So we did that. We traveled around, we went to Lane Deer. We came back to Bozeman the next morning, my text message, I get about five text messages in a row. My uncle had slept on it, you know, he woke up with these thoughts, and uh, he always has been a leader for me, and <coughs> that was one of his questions in, in his text message. Shane, if you had to send a message 12,500 years into the future, what would it be? <laughs> and how would you know, how could you know that people would understand what you were trying to say. That question to me embodied what that burial represented. You know, there was so much love and care in that uh, last rest for that little boy there uh, that the message was so clear, it was unmistakable. You know, these people dearly loved this little boy. And, you know, he couldn't miss it. He said, he kept on sending me more, just a few more messages. One of the messages he sent was, Shane, you know, do you have anything 250 years old? I don't. You know, he collects old stuff. He's got a whole garage full of old stuff, you know, but nothing that old. These people did. You know, this wasn't some animal that they found on the ground, on the ground, on the ground probably. We know that's... <laughs> Not possible, probably, with all the wolves and carnivores in that area, the idea that an elk antler would lay around for a couple hundred years before people picked it up. This was something that they had, that they kept for generations. People held it in their hands. You know? And you talk about those tools that went in to that little boy's burial. You know, we know, I know that there's, there was slobber, that that little boy cut his teeth on some of those points, that they were laying around the lodge, you know. He's crawling around now, and now he's on his feet. He's getting into all the little things, and he's picking them up, putting them in his mouth. You know, man, the emotion, the, the imagery that, that came up. <coughs> Overwhelming. You know? And so that's where I got the title. And I thought, if there's anyone in Bozeman who's an academic, who really and truly in her heart believes that there's going to be people around on this planet in 12,500 years? <laughs> you know, I'd like to hear him describe how that's going to come about. Because at the rate we're going, I don't know if that's really a legitimate <laughs> scientific, uh, you know, pre prediction. You know, I would say that you would probably want to hedge your bet on that one. And so, that's one of the questions that this boy has, has brought us all here tonight to ask ourselves. And what would we leave to those descendants so far down the line that they could enjoy what we've enjoyed? You know, I think that's one of the top questions. And so, now I'm going to get started. What do you think of that? <laughs> How much time did I burn there? Well, thanks, Larry, for this image. This is actually the Anzac site. And uh, this point here in the Shields River Valley is actually the highest point in the valley. And, uh, you know, it's a prominent, prominent point. If you, those of you who like to go swimming at White Sulphur Springs, uh, if you just keep driving a little ways north here, you know, the, the land comes up a little ways. It goes up a little ways as you exit out of this valley and you start heading over into that next drainage. And ever since I, I think I was 19 years old, you know, it's been a while, you know, I'm getting, well, you know, I'm still fairly young. It's been 20 years, <laughs> over 20 years. <laughs> over 20 years ago, I, I hit that spot driving with some friends, and, you know, every time I go to that spot, it's the same feeling. It's, it's an amazing spot. And so, going there that day when Larry invited me, Larry Laren invited me to meet Eski and these other guys, I was just thinking about that place and how that place has always been so special to me. I can't really 
explain why it, or what it meant to me, but the view of it and the feeling like you're kind of like lifted up in the air. I don't know how many of you know the spot that I'm talking about. Most people know it's kind of like when you're driving into the Flathead Valley and you come over that valley hill and then all of a sudden the Mission Mountains are there. She's nodding her head. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Same spot. Same type of thing. You know, you're kind of sitting there, you're kind of floating, you know. And if you drive there, you'll know. Anzac is only, I'd say, probably less than, you know, five miles from that. And so going there, it was very emotional for me that day. And we, we came down there and we looked at it. And, uh, you know, Eski uh, told me what he discovered. And uh, it was just, you know, like I said, it was overwhelming. Trying to take it all in. How do I feel about it? What does it mean? Um, and so, you know, I, I think I've told this to uh, several of the reporters. My life hasn't quite been the same since that day. You know, trying to figure out what does this mean for all of us and, and what's going to be my role in this. I got, and I don't know how many of you have read the story. I'm sure probably a lot of you have read it, but when I got there that day, uh, to the Anzic site in, in September to meet the geneticists and Larry and Sarah Anzic and some of the other folks involved. Um, they told me about the findings and you know they had a film crew there, right? Filming me. My tears are welling up on film. And uh, I said, you know, this little boy has given us uh, so much, more than anyone could have ever imagined. Could his parents have possibly imagined what, what this little boy was going to give to us? You know, there's no possible way. But yet they prepared him for this journey too. They pr prepared him fully, as well as they could. And I said, you know, this boy has given us a lot. I think we deserve now to respect him and his parents put him back where his parents left him. And so, uh, you know, the next day, uh, SK and I were going to go traveling to the different reservations, and uh, that's when he, he said that Sarah Anzik had wanted me to approach the different tribal historic preservation officers about reburial, repatriation for the boy. And so, that's that's kind of the, the story about how we got around to the reservations and why we started talking and engaging people about this. Going back to the site, again, this is a, a great image from Larry. Uh, you can see the waterway coming down through the Shields River Valley there. And the place that I was talking about uh, is just right up around here, the road going towards White Sulphur Springs. Uh, it's just right over around in here. I believe this is, must be the Shields River. It's probably the Flathead Creek. And the, the creek coming around over from the Bridger Mountains. And so, a long time ago, there were all kinds of animals that came through this waterway migrating. You know, and with the mountains around on all the sides, it was like, as Larry said, like a giant corral. And so, people who lived here really were in an incredible place for hunter-gatherers. So the hunter-gatherer tools uh, that, uh, that we find from that period and, and going back to the Paleo-Indian days, uh, the oldest are, are the Clovis, uh, the oldest confirmed points going back to about 11,500 years and then going all the way up uh, to 8,000 years, we, we have a variety of different points that are used. Uh, but again, hunters and gatherers. This is before the advent of uh, agriculture. Where did these people come from? Uh, according to S.K. Willerstab, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the 24,000-year-old Siberian boy. And they, they're calling him the Malta boy. And what's so uh, interesting, fascinating about all this is so much of this, this ancient DNA is coming from children. And one of the things that's so remarkable about that is that those, that's the place where you would least expect to find ancient DNA.
because children's bones are smaller, they're, you know, they're less developed, and so, you know, they're going to be more exposed to the elements and they're likely to be deteriorated uh, greater than adult. Uh, but this one, there was a six-year-old boy uh, that, that was 24,000 years old that they did a DNA analysis on and showed that the folks over here in the Americas basically share uh, one-third of that guy's DNA. We share one-third of his DNA contemporary American Indians. And so the other two-thirds of it were, must have come from populations in this region here before they crossed over into the Americas. Probably, you know, the, the, this major migration that this Clovis boy, the Anzac boy was associated with was probably, his people probably came over 15,000 years ago. There are sites that are older and in South America, there are sites that are as old as uh, 30,000. Uh, but again, no human remains associated with those. And difficult, to, you know, there's a lot of people talking about what those really mean, what those sites really mean. So during the Ice Age, uh, you know, 20,000 years ago, that, that ice sheet had come all the way down. But as it starts to recede, you know, it, they, there's, there's a corridor that develops here. That's one theory. Another theory is that they came around down here uh, along the uh, ocean and then kind of migrated through here in the uh, continental interior. We see older sites around in there. Uh, so those are the two major points that you hear archaeologists talk about where uh, the Clovis people came from who basically are Native American. And, uh, you know, according to S.K. Willerslev, uh, he believes, you know, his theory is that, again, the Native Americans, their, their uh, ancestors basically came together uh, in northern Siberia and created that overall population before they entered into the Americas. That's his theory. I don't really have a theory on it myself. I'm just, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure if it really matters to me, to be honest with you. I mean, somewhere around there, 15,000, sure, yeah, that sounds good. You know? I'm not really going to fight anyone over approximate age or dates. Uh, you know, in Indian country, we'd like to use uh, time immemorial. You know, that's kind of the going phrase that we like to use. Uh, so, after, you know, 10, 12,000 years, People populating the Americas, agriculture starts to develop. Uh, it's developed in South America. It makes its way into the north. Uh, you know, by 1,500 years ago or so, you have a lot of agriculture developing. Corn, beans, and squash. But not here, in the Medicine Mill country. The Medicine Mill country is, is Montana. Montana, northern <coughs> Wyoming, uh, eastern or Western Dakotas and on up into Canada. Within that range there, they, find, they found 70 of these medicine wheels. All the tribes within that area also have similar cultural conventions and ceremonial uh, uh, uses, such as the Sundance, which comes directly really from the medicine wheel. You know, you talk to tribal people, Sundance chiefs, you know, that's where it comes from. Sundance comes from the medicine wheel. Other tribes don't do the Sundance. Plains Indians do. Uh, you start looking into this theory about the medicine wheel country, what is it? Uh, what does it really mean? Uh, it holds true today. You know, it's still the medicine wheel country, you know. There's still not very many people that live here. Still very difficult for agricultural production here. Even with sprinklers. <laughs> you know? And uh, back in the old days, uh, the crows actually tried to grow corn on the Yellowstone River. Uh, and you know, who knows how long ago that was, right? Right around Springdale, um, just this side of Big Timber, there's a place there called uh, where the corn died. <laughs> and, uh, you can see why. <laughs> Anything would have died there, you know? Uh, there's a really wonderful hot spring 
Wednesday, or you guys know what I'm talking about, those of you from Montana. And uh, apparently there was a, a, some people from Japan that bought that area and tried to put like a, a, a greenhouse there. And, uh, you know, I guess they fi eventually found the greenhouse over in Glendive, one of those winds coming through. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they quit there. You know, like, this isn't the right spot, you know. And so people have always known that. And so the medicine wheel, you know, it's not just about the Sundance. It's about the human condition. And it's about the Great Plains, you know. And if you look at Great Plains culture, Great Plains sign language, like really the only sign language in America that covers such a vast region, you know. You watch people do Plains Indian sign language, it's always in a circle. Everything's in a circle and they're pointing which direction they know exactly where they're at. You know, I'm pointing to the west right now, right? Always knowing exactly where they're at, and they're telling stories. And they went up north, and then they went down south, and went back this way. That whole, that's cultural continuity there in the northern plains. And these Anzic people, these, these Clovis people, they live basically almost the exact same way that the plains Indians lived right up to the time that the Bozeman Trail was established, which is hunting and gathering. By the time, you know, these guys had horses and, of course, the Plains Indians, and it's, you know, it's a completely different culture. But, you know, their way of life, uh, their ceremonies, their, their economy was all based on this medicine wheel. And guess what that is? That's the moon. Isn't that something? Right there, I believe, is Mars coming up. This photo was taken on the top of Medicine Wheel Mountain, uh, and I want to thank Ivy Marriott uh, for this. Uh, the guy that actually took the photo, his, his, uh, his light kind of got in the way there. But he was, he was basically measuring, you know, where the wheel, different things come up on the cairns and whatnot. Um, but just an incredible image. Uh, again, for this place, this special place where we live, and that's why, again, it's so remarkable, I feel like, that the Anzic, the Clovis boy was found here in Montana, because we've never changed. We never did grow corn, beans, and squash. We traded for that, you know? Everybody else was growing stuff all around us, and down in the Southwest, corn, you know, Hidatsa, corn, not Blackfeet, not Crow, not Shoshone, and these other guys that round down here. You know, they had a different way of life, and it was the same way of life again that these Anzic people shared. And so that's why it was so remarkable for me to, to kind of, you know, realize that. Where did the uh, Montana tribes come from? This is a linguistic map here, kind of trying to uh, locate where different tribes came from. Uh, when when uh, the whole issue of the Anzic remains came up. Who are going to get, who's going to get these remains? The reason why they called me, one of the main reasons is because that country there used to be part of the Crow Indian Reservation. But we know as Crow people that uh, our migration stories have us coming here to Montana within the past, you know, a thousand years. You know, I mean, that's pretty much common knowledge within, amongst the Crow Indian tribe. So, the elders at Crow didn't believe that this little boy was one of our tribal members because he was too old for that. This was one of the comments that was made. Um, how, how, so what are the tribes that have been here the longest? And how long have they been here? Uh, these are questions, you know, that we'll probably never really know for sure. We know that the Kootenai are the only language isolated in Montana. And so when we went up there to talk to them, they had some interesting things to say, and they're very helpful. Uh, if you want to find any information about the Kootenai, you have to go visit and talk to them, because there's no books about them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's very little written about them. And, uh, you know, they don't seem to be too concerned about it either. You know? <laughs> and so they're, they're very interesting to talk to. And uh, Francis all up there said, you know, we've been here, Shane, for at least 10,000 years, at least, probably much longer than that. Our language doesn't come from anywhere. It developed here, it stayed here. You know, our creation stories have us coming out of the Yellowstone Park and all along the Rocky Mountain front. 
which is exactly where the Clovis boy was found on the Anzac property. Right along the Rocky Mountain front, that was a major corridor. Go up through White Sulphur Springs, up through the Smith River Valley, hop out into you know, the Great Falls country, now you're in a different region. These were pathways and corridors that the Kootenai people had lived on for thousands and thousands of years. The Kootenai, are the Blackfeet as well, uh, and Shoshone. Uh, although, you know, linguists claim that, uh, you know, the Blackfeet migrated from eastward, you know, there's, that's open for dispute. Uh, so, it's interesting that as the, as the Crow tribe uh, take kind of taking care of these remains and getting ready for a reburial now, uh, and presenting it to the tribal officials and, and asking them for their opinion and their input, and, and then going back to their cultural committees and reporting, you know, basically getting back to me, most of them, and saying, we want someone to take the lead on it. You, you take the lead on it. And so that, it was very, uh, I thought it was kind of remarkable, really. There wasn't any fighting. Um, it was just people concerned about getting, doing the right thing. So that, that was an interesting part of, of my story as well. <coughs> Uh, 1850, Montana groups it again, uh, where the Anzac boy was found, the Clovis boy, uh, you know, right around in this area here, part of the original Crow Indian Reservation. I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. I brought this photo up because, uh, you know, the Anzac, the whole Anzac uh, burial really brought home, the, again, the idea of family and the importance of children in tribal communities. And children are not left out of anything. You know, they're always included. And, uh, you know, there's always been a real strong relationship between elders and children. And that has, was always the root of our strength. And, you know, uh, the idea that, uh, again, that these people put the last full measure of devotion into this burial for this Anzig boy. You know, when you have the ultimate amount of grief, you know, you have to consummate it in a way that, the, in the best way you know how, to, in order for you to heal, you have to give your last full measure of devotion and not leave anything out. That's why there were 125 points, 125 objects in that burial. That's, big, that's why there wasn't just 60 or 50 or even 25 or 30. There was 125, and that's why they had that elk antler that was absolutely precious that their great, 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 great grandparents had held on to. And they self, unselfishly put it in there. You know? I mean, we've kept those values all this time, I think. Despite all the trauma that our communities have endured. And so, you know, you think about, uh, you know, eras in which children were kind of, you know, taken away from families, and families suffered, and we're still recovering from that, really. And so, there at that uh, Anzic site, at the burial site, you know, it occurred to me too, you know, this, the 21st century really is about healing. It's about coming together and healing. And, uh, you know, this little boy has given us the opportunity to do that. And, you know, we need to respect it and take advantage of it. That's how I felt. And so I feel like, you know, not only as tribal people do we need to heal and reconcile with our own history and with who we are today, but we also have to reconcile with Scientific communities, scientific communities have to reconcile with us. We have to figure out for ourselves what DNA means to us, how is it useful for us, how we can best use it and control it. <coughs> These are all things that, that, that are, the future holds in the 21st century. And, you know, that we can uh, get back to where we were. And so there's a healing, you know, and... You know, when I went out to Copenhagen, uh, S.K. Willersliff took me out there um, 
in December to talk to his graduate students and, you know, his staff, his faculty, and uh, then I, he invited me out. I'm taking a couple of tribal historic preservation officers again to Copenhagen in May. So I'm very excited to, to go back out there and take these tribal people there. Um, but I was talking to his graduate students and I told them, you know, all this DNA information that you have is very, very important. It's going to teach us about disease, it's going to teach us about where we come from, it's going to teach us all these important things about ourselves. But there's some things that it's not going to be able to teach us. You know, there's other things that we have to be able to incorporate into our lives in order to make this meaningful. You know, and you have to know how to heal. Did you guys study that in graduate school? You know? Did they take you to a lab and show you how to heal? Yeah. Man, they really didn't really answer those questions. You know, I didn't really expect an answer. But I think they got the point. You know, that this kind of research is really useless and, and, and doesn't have any application whatsoever to anyone's life. It's completely irrelevant unless you find the social and cultural ties and implications that make it meaningful. And you give the people who are really, you know, this information is coming from, you give them, empower them with the ability to take care of that themselves. You know? And so that, I guess that was my message out there. And they, they're absolutely open to that message and I think um, appreciate it very much. And uh, just to kind of end on this last slide here and, and give you an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, you know, this is the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, and, you know, my uncle took me up there when I was a little kid, and uh, I've gone up there, you know, again, uh, almost every summer, uh, and it's a place to heal, and, you know, I feel like, again, that this boy has given us an opportunity to do that. Uh, there was a knock at my door uh, just the other day. Shane, uh, there was someone wanted to send a message to you. Oh, shoot. Is it one of those ticking? Uh, <laughs> no. They said, are they going to bury that little boy with his stuff? No. Well, then you ought to get some new stuff for him. Oh. No. Have a bunch of people chip in. Get some new points made. Get some new stuff. And that way everyone can heal with this little boy. Kind of like offer, make an offering to him. You know? Wow, that's a good idea. I, I like that idea. You know, I don't know how we would do that, but I'm open to that possibility. And then the idea as well that, you know, um, there's going to be a memorial there for that little boy. So everyone who comes through, you know, will know uh, the importance of that place. Mike Waters, who is the uh, the director of the uh, Center for uh, Study of First Americans, uh, he said, Shane, you know, that should be a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's how important that place is. Mm -hmm. you know? I believe it. You know, w will it become? I don't know. But I don't see too many other places that are, that are more important than that. And to the story of America, this is the story of America. It took us to the 21st century to find the beginnings of our story. And how many centuries will it take for us to, to tell the story and unfold it? You know, and so it's just been a remarkable journey for me and I feel like I'm just getting started on it. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to you know, putting this little boy back where he was uh, found and uh, having some healing on that day. And so we're looking forward to doing that in like the second week in June. So with that, I guess I'll kind of open it up for questions. Anyone has any? Yeah? That elk holder, was that a tool or just a toy for the boy? Oh, was, all of them were tools. Oh, well, they were all tools. And they were toys, too. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. You know, if you had a tool around your house and your grandson picked it up and put it in its mouth, then it becomes a toy. <laughs> <laughs> so... It depends on who's using it and what they're doing with it. You know, you can take a spoon and do a lot of weird things with it, you know, and but it's still going to be a spoon.
up to SK2. And, uh, you know, I don't think that's possible in this case because there wasn't enough uh, material left. With the Kennewick Man, I think it was different. So they were able to do that with the Kennewick Man. And that changed the whole game, right? I mean, the Kennewick Man, that image, that singular image of Jean Luc Picard, <laughs> <laughs> it's like turned the whole world onto. Uh, there was white people in America and they were flying starships, you know? I mean, just kidding. <laughs> Indian humor, gotta have a little Indian humor. But no, you're right. If, 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 even if they were able to have done that, I think he was so young that, you know, and babies have such fat faces at that age and stuff that I think it would have been hard to, to recreate. But I think it would be important still probably to have an image associated what? with this little boy so that we can kind of identify with him. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Shane? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I was wondering um, what historical connections have been made from the medicine wheel in Wyoming here in the Big Horns and this ANSIC site. I mean, do they go back? Are they contemporary with one another? Or Well, I think this one here is 1,600 years old is what they've measured it. So ANSIC goes back much, much, much further than that. Um, but there are about 70 of these wheels all around. And I don't know if they know how old all of them are. And, you know, the idea that there could have been some earlier that then were kind of disrupted and destroyed, that's, that's something to consider too. The, one of the di most direct links that we have, and it's not necessarily to the wheel itself, but I believe that some of the rocks or some of the stone tools that the boy was buried with some of those rocks came from the Bighorn. Is that correct, Larry? What's that? Did some of those rocks come from the Bighorn? That were in yeah, the Anzac right. area? Yeah. <coughs> some of the artifacts, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Did you have a question? No, I don't Oh. <laughs> I have a question. Um, did, are you going to turn this on? No, it's on. It's on. Okay. Um, I'm interested in this idea that you have of people contributing things to go into the memorial for this little boy. I, I, I think it's kind of a neat one because it shows that we could do the same thing that his family did. We yeah. could give things because we love him too. Yeah. And I like that idea, but got to be careful, see, yeah. because if you do that and then somebody 12,500 years from now digs it up, yeah. <laughs> you're going to get the wrong story. Yeah, there's a lot to consider there. And then what if we get, what if everybody in here tries to give spear points? I, I actually might be 125 people in here, but, uh, you know, what if we get way more than we need? And so there's, you know, we need to figure out a way. It's a great idea, and I love the thought of it. And, you know, it's just, like you say, there's practical things that have to be worked out there. And then also, if you don't, or if you're not able to contribute at this level, you can certainly contribute uh, when we have the memorial. And that's going to be a real important piece that is going to need a lot of funding. Hi Shane, how you doing? <laughs> I just want to say uh, thank you for talking, and you know it's a pleasure to see you up on stage. And, um, one thing I'm wondering about is, you know, why do you still think that uh, kind of these theories that were going off of that we weren't here and that they came from us? So, like, I don't know if you don't care about that, but the idea that we've been here from the beginning and they came from us, like, why are we looking at it? Oh, Still, yeah, I see. Why didn't we? Why didn't, yeah, you know, I guess my your question is why am I not angry at the Bering Strait theory? No, not that. Not only that, but just like these are theories that people write about. So when are yeah. we going to start writing our own theories? Yeah. Like, well, frankly, it doesn't really matter to me. Yeah. It has no. Sure. I mean, I, I love it, right? I mean, I, it, it intrigues me as an intellectual. I can't get enough of it. I love it. I eat it up. But as a as a personal level. On a personal level, it doesn't really mean anything to me. Because it doesn't really matter to me. We, maybe we came here 500 years ago. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe we came here 500,000 years ago. And so that's where I'm at with it. And so some people really get, you know, find Deloria. Shoot, man, that guy spent a whole book on it. Like, man, that guy had a lot of energy. Shoot, I, don't, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I give, I run every day, you know, but I certainly couldn't sit down and apply myself to fight the Bering Strait theory for 500 pages. I mean, I don't think there's, it's, it, it just neither here nor there for me. I think
think we need to move beyond it. As Indian people, we need to tell these white people, hey, dude, it doesn't matter, okay? I mean, you got here on a boat, you came from Ireland, okay, that's where we're at right now. You know, what, what are the important issues dealing in our lives right now that we need to address? That, that's kind of how I feel about it. But I, I appreciate your question very much, and, and I, I was kind of waiting for that one to come up, too. <laughs> yeah? Is there a consensus as to the origin of tribal di differentiation as to whether or not uh, uh, the differences among the groups uh, was pre cordillera and Car Carter or uh, after they came through the Carter and then differentiated? That's a great question. The, uh, the question is, uh, can you correspond basically the divergence of those groups? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's one of the questions that they have that they're still trying to answer. Um, there definitely was a divergence of the populations between North and South America. They don't know exactly when or why, um, but that's one of the things at least uh, Willerstow was speculating. That's a great question. One of the uh, ways we could possibly try and answer that is um, we don't have any, or they don't have any, I should say, uh, DNA samples from North American Indians. Uh, and the whole world has DNA samples. <laughs> except for North American Indians, because we've been really opposed to that. And so, you know, according to S.K. Willerstead, it's like a white spot on the map. You know? And so, but that's one of the reasons why there's speculations about 80% of the descendants of our <coughs> the, uh, Indians in the Americas descending from that boy were rough, because we don't have any data. They don't have any data from North America. If they did, then maybe they could kind of, you know, start to develop some stronger theories about when and how that divergence occurred. But I think one of their goals is to be able to, you know, get that white spot colored in. Uh, but, you know, trying to get Indian, our blood out of the Indian is like trying to milk a buffalo calf, you know, our buffalo bull. Can't, can't you get you DNA out of, you're doing. out of your hair? What's that? Can't you get DNA out of your hair after a haircut? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get DNA out of hair now. You can get a lot of DNA. It's just that people are unwilling, and I don't think they saw the relevance of it. But, you know, I think there, there's a potential now. If, if I take these people back to Copenhagen, and, uh, you know, we figure out what this is all about and use it for ourselves, you know, um, and control it, you know. I mean, this is the fact of the matter. The Geogenetic Center in Copenhagen, Denmark, isn't closing anytime soon. <laughs> you know, it's a hundred and seventy million dollar lab. You know, they're not going anywhere. People from all over the world send them DNA to analyze. As American Indians, we could be right there at the table with this guy, controlling our own destiny with it, figuring our own, you know, uh, future with it. And I think if we didn't do that, we'd be foolish. And that's where the world's kind of going as far as DNA. Yep. <clears throat> um, is there evidence to support that the points were manufactured by the same person? I don't think that they can prove whether or not the same person did it. Aren't there like different, well there's obviously different style points, but yeah. different makers have their own style? That's a good question. Yeah, I think Bill McConnell might be a better, better person to ask that. It seems to me like if, you know, if you find Clovis points all around, then they're basically using the same type of method. And so if they're using the same type of method, I think it might be a little more difficult to really get, you know, a personal touch on it. But that, that's a good question, too. I had a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, you know, since this has come to light, have you seen um, a relaxing of the idea of North American Indians donating uh, to get more answers now that this has come to light? I mean, it's fairly recent, but... Um, have you seen people kind of indicate that they're more willing to, to go that route and try to find that connection? Um, you know, I've had a few emails from people from, you know, Cherokee and you know, some people from Alaska emailed me. Um, but really no one here in Montana has, is, has reached out to me yet. And even with, throughout this whole process, uh, there hasn't been an overwhelming interest from tribal people about it. 
But I think it's probably one of those things that's going to take some time to sink in. It's like your uncle thinking of everything. Yeah, right. Yeah. And he's really in tune with that. My uncle, he's, he's always been in tune with that. And so I think he understood like the real significance of it. But when we went to Croatia see that day to have the international uh, telephone conference, uh, press briefing, yeah, there were Crow Indians in there, uh, but you know they didn't seem like they were all that interested in what was going on. They were more interested if there was any donuts around or coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you guys came all the way from Bozeman and didn't bring any donuts? Ah, shoot, Costco was closed last night when we got to But uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think, like I said, if we take these people to Copenhagen and kind of you know show them what these guys are doing and uh, figure out how we can do this in a respectful way, that it's nothing to be afraid of, um, you know, and there's nothing to be fighting over, uh, then we can, we can start to develop, I think we can start to go somewhere with it. Because I don't think, if you ask young Indian people, they, they're, they're fearless, they don't care. Take my DNA, go for it, what are you gonna do with it, you know? Yeah. I mean, and so I think tapping into that, that youth culture, is one of the keys and you know with any culture right. development. Well with this all coming to light it would be fascinating to, to connect those dots finally and, and see what kind of answers came out of it that's for sure and, and, and tied into that my original question was you were talking about the Kootenai and the mm -hmm. fact that their origin stories come from this region and maybe the Blackfeet yeah. um, but that a lot of others tended to have migrated in here it was found on the Crow Reservation did the Kootenai indicate that they felt a bigger connection to this yeah, they did. Have they indicated that they want to be a part of this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've been talking to them. I just talk to them all the time. You know, and, and they're basically like, go ahead and take the lead on it, and then, you know, if, if things fall through, we can help you out. It's very, uh, it's very low stress. It's not, you know, people are, it's unprecedented in a lot of ways, and so, and people are really, from my experience, have been really good to deal with. They're open-minded. They're, they're not quick to jump to conclusions. At least that's the people that I've been working with. So yeah, that's a good question, and they're going to be involved all along too. Thank you. Thank you. Hey Shane, thank you for your presentation. This is Francine, in case you yeah. can't see me. <laughs> I can see you. Um, I'm from Northern Cheyenne, and I have um, an interest in you know, how you are going to go about um, respectfully reburying this boy. Um, because, you know, back then they couldn't probably have predicted that they were going to find him and, and do all the things that they're doing to him and then returning him back to where they found him. And so um, that's a big responsibility to respectfully return him and how, you know, what, what are the, some thoughts on that and what are your thoughts on that and, and how will that play out? Yeah, well, it's been a collaborative effort uh, because there are so many different things to consider with the burial, not just the respectful nature of it and how it's gonna 